This is Duke University. Good afternoon. My name is Neil Siegel, and I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Uh, if you're returning to Duke, I welcome you back. And if you have just completed your first week of law school, uh, I welcome you to law school if I have not done so already. Uh, the mission of the program in public law is to promote better understanding of public institutions in the United States, of the constitutional framework within which they operate, and of the legal principles that apply to the work of public officials. Here at Duke Law School, the program sponsors conferences, workshops, and informal lunches on topical issues, holds moot courts in cases pending before the Supreme Court of the United States. We have one coming up on October 5th. Uh, we sponsor visits by present or past elected officials and public lawyers, and sometimes we tempt them down here with basketball tickets. Uh, and we raise the visibility of public lawyering as an option for law students to pursue. Uh, to reach a broader audience, the program uh, in public law supports and distributes public law scholarship and commentary by members of the Duke faculty as well as others. The program is supported very, very generously by Rick Horvitz, uh, Duke Law School, class of 1978. Um, this program would not exist without his support, and the public law faculty is deeply indebted to Rick uh, for his commitment both to the program and to the law school. Uh, our first event this year is a retrospective on Senior Associate Justice John Paul Stevens. My colleague Ernie Young brought me a bow tie. I didn't have time between class and now <laughs> to put it on, his sartorial trademark. Uh, Justice Stevens stepped down effective June 29th at the age of 90, right? born in 1920. If you are less than 34 and a half years old, you are only now learning what it's like to live in this country, right, or anywhere for that matter, without John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court of the United States. We have a wonderful panel with us, some Duke Law faculty and some distinguished visitors from other law schools. Uh, first, I'll introduce Jeffrey Dobbins, uh, who is a 1994 graduate of Duke Law School. Uh, he graduated first in his class here, also has a master's degree from the School of the Environment went on to clerk for Justice Stevens during the October 1995 term. Uh, he joined the Willamette faculty uh, in 2006. This is uh, the Willamette University School of Law after practicing both in uh, public and private sectors. And he's argued, more, argued and briefed more than 50 cases uh, uh, in federal and state appellate courts around the country. Uh, also want to introduce Andrew, Andy Siegel, Andrew Siegel, an associate professor of law at Seattle University School of Law. I've already been asked if there's any relation uh, between us. As far as I know, the answer is no. There are a number of seagulls out there, and they're not all flying. Um, uh, Andy is a distinguished graduate of the NYU Law School, um, where I think he also graduated first in his class, uh, clerk for Justice Stevens during the October 2000 term, which um, I understand was the Bush versus Gore term. So I'm sure Andy will be happy to spill uh, everything that happened behind the scenes uh, during that historical moment in constitutional history. We also have Professor Barack Richmond with us, a uh, member of the Duke Law faculty. Uh, he is, uh, uh, teaches and researches in the area of contract law, healthcare law, uh, antitrust policy. I think he's also pretty good on the Talmud, I understand. Uh, but he's going to talk about Justice Stevens, the antitrust lawyer. Uh, he had a distinguished career as an antitrust lawyer law bef long before he was put on the Supreme Court. And finally, my colleague Ernie Young, uh, who did not clerk for Justice Stevens, but did clerk for Justice Souter, and uh, was at the court, um, uh, and I imagine got to know Justice Stevens somewhat during his time there as well. He's uh, a leading authority, one of the leading authorities in the nation on the constitutional law of federalism, teaches constitutional law, also teaches and writes in the area of federal jurisdiction, as well as foreign relations law. So I think what we'll do is have uh, our guests speak in that order for 10 minutes each, and that will leave us uh, 15 minutes for questions. We're going to have to end promptly at 1.15, and I do uh, encourage uh, audience participation questions after you have heard all of them speak. Uh, without further ado, uh, Jeff. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Neil, uh, and uh, thanks to you and to the Center for Public Policy and Duke for bringing me back. It's really great to be back here, although I have to say that uh, I only recognize uh, the one central stairwell from the time when I was here. Everything else is completely different, uh, and so uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be back. I, um, uh, I was reflecting back on the, the summer after graduating from law school, which was when uh, you know, I had the call from Justice Stevens Chambers and the call to come out and, and interview with him. And I remember sitting, went up to DC for a late afternoon interview uh, and was sitting in the law library reading room at the Library of Congress trying to get myself up to speed and think a little bit about sorts of things to talk about and try and be reasonably intelligent when I went in and, and, and talked to the justice. And um, I, I remembered reading one article that talked about how uh, the justice, uh, in the view of a former clerk, was, uh, would have been a great person to work for, whether you were working at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, or uh, uh, pumping gas at a gas station. And uh, uh, that view was confirmed for me when I interviewed with him and during the course of the year that I was there with him. And I, I think sort of Justice Stevens' uh, kind of his humility, his uh, sort of sense of being down to earth, uh, are sort of one of three things that you see mentioned a lot when you see people talking about the justice and, and thinking about his, his career there is sort of his, his humility, his dedication to kind of an individualized factual determination uh, in every case and the importance of facts in every case. Uh, and, uh, and then sort of his tendency to uh, sort of go his own way when he was writing uh, whether he's writing his own uh, concurring opinions or whether he's writing his own dissenting opinions. And when I was thinking about uh, what sorts of things I might say here, I was trying to bring all of those different aspects together in some ways and, and try and uh, talk a little bit about how uh, all of those things in some ways fit together in kind of uh, the justice's view of the role of the Supreme Court in our legal system. And I don't want to talk a lot about sort of the Supreme Court in sort of a Federalist perspective, which I think I, you know, we're going to hear about from Ernie and, and others. But, uh, but I, I want to think about it in the sense of uh, the, the way that he viewed the court's role as sort of the end of this legal process. Um, and the, the case that I think in some ways is a, is a useful way of thinking about this is a relatively recent one. Uh, and this is a, a case uh, of uh, Scott versus Harris, which is a 2007 decision uh, in which the justice wrote the single dissenting opinion. And, and I would point out that I think SCOTUS blog had a little bit of a statistical analysis on this. And the, the Justice Stevens had as many lone dissents on the court over the last five years as Justice Thomas did. Uh, and so uh, you know, this, this tendency of the justice to kind of write his own decisions and to, to articulate his own rationale for cases, whether he's writing by himself in dissent or whether he's concurring, uh, was something that you saw kind of again and again. And in, in Scott versus Harris, it was kind of a very typical kind of case in some ways. This was, uh, uh, for those of you that might have run across it or didn't run across it in civil procedure or otherwise, this was a case where there had been a, a, an automobile chase. Uh, Mr. Uh, Harris was seen uh, speeding down a Georgia highway uh, going, I think, 73 in a 55 zone. And instead of pulling over, he decided to run. Uh, and so he sped along sort of these dark Georgia highways for uh, about 10 miles, about six minutes. And then finally, one of the pursuing officers, Scott, bumped into the car. It spun out of control and crashed. And Harris was left a, a quadriplegic. Um, he ended up suing the officer, and uh, the theory being that uh, there had been an improper and, in fact, unconstitutional use of excessive force in the case. And um, the, the trial court uh, got from the officer a motion to dismiss on qualified immunity grounds. And the theory was, look, uh, you know, this was a reasonable use of force. This guy's driving around. He's causing a danger to everybody else who's on the roads. And we had to get him off the roads. And uh, the district court considered that and rejected the summary judgment argument on qualified immunity grounds and said, uh, no, we think that a reasonable jury could, you know, could conclude that this officer was, was acting unreasonably at that point in time. Uh, and the district court denied the summary judgment motion. It was affirmed at the Court of Appeals, and then it went up to the Supreme Court, where by eight, an 8-1 eight vote, the court reversed and said, qualified immunity applies here. And one of the things that the court heavily relied upon were videotapes, the dashboard cams from the officers. And so it was like an episode of Cops or something like that, where uh, you know, you, that the court actually had available to it this, uh, this videotape. And um, Justice Stevens wrote uh, 
a dissent to, to Justice Scalia's opinion. Justice Scalia said basically, well, take a look at the videotape. You know, your own eyes will tell you that no reasonable juror could ever conclude that this was uh, that this was unreasonable because this was a terribly dangerous activity. Um, and Justice Stevens wrote this lone dissent. He said, look, I, you know, a reasonable jury could reach an opposite conclusion. And he actually had this kind of amusing footnote. And for those of you that, that are skeptical about whether uh, you know, justices write their own opinions or not, his footnote said, had my colleagues learned to drive when most high-speed driving took place on two-lane roads rather than on superhighways, when split-second judgments about the risk of passing a slow post in the face of oncoming traffic were routine, they might well have reacted to the videotape more dispassionately. I feel relatively certain, I wasn't there at the time, <laughs> that Justice Stevens wrote that footnote. That was not a clerk who was drafting that one. Um, and, and this is the thing about the justice's sort of dedication to factual determination is that one of the things I remember is that he would write his own drafts and one of the things that he did is he did that because he wanted to make sure that the facts were right, that the sort of the core factual uh, points that he felt that the case turned on uh, were there and were embedded in the case. And so um, that sort of dedication to this individualized factual determination was a very sort of strong touch point that I noticed about the justice over the course of the years. He, he also, again, as this case demonstrates, he would go out on his own and he would make his own points about why it was that he believed the particular outcome of an individual case needed to come out the way that it did. And it strikes me that one of the things that, that the justice was doing was he was not, it's not just that he had this great intellect and he thought about things creatively and carefully and tried to look at it from different perspectives, but I think that there's a conviction on his part that the court itself was... Um, certainly was a necessary part of the legal system, but it was a narrowly constrained part of the legal system. They didn't always have the right answer. And so I think in some ways the rationale behind why he wrote in any particular case was of course motivated by what was going on in that case. But in some ways his willingness to say sort of over and over again that the court was incorrect and to do that on an individualized basis I think had a lot to do with his conviction that look, these individual decisions that the court is making are not always the absolute definite right answer in these cases. And so he's, he always was willing uh, to call out the court and to point out that there was another way of thinking about the case. And so when it comes back to this question about humility and this sort of, this sort of great politeness and the ease with which you work with Justice Stevens, I think it rolls back to this idea about his perspective on the court. Uh, the court was there, it was a necessary role, but it was also very limited. Uh, it should decide what it had to decide and no more. Uh, and it was always appropriate in a given case to point out why it was that the decisions that the court was making might possibly have been wrong. Uh, and so uh, I think that, uh, that those are some of the most kind of significant ways of thinking about the, the role of the justice on the court uh, that I've thought about in coming, coming here today. So. Thank you very much. Andy. Thank you, Neil. Um, again, I want to begin by thanking uh, my friend and namesake, as you heard, Neil Siegel, for uh, the invitation here. Um, also, obviously, want to say at the outset uh, that it was a great honor to clerk for Justice Stevens um, for many of the reasons that, Je that Jeff has laid out. Uh, he was a wonderful boss, um, and uh, I very much enjoy these events um, in tribute to him. I always worry about the language here in retrospective suggests that he's done, and he's certainly done on the court, but um, he's doing some writing on his own, and he's out there in the world, and uh, we don't want to assume that the intellectual life of John Paul Stevens is, uh, is, in, any way, is in any way over. Uh, clerking for Justice Stevens um, has inspired a number of different articles I've written on different aspects of his jurisprudence, particularly his equal protection jurisprudence. Um, I've given many presentations on his role on the court and the future of the court, and I'm really open um, during the question period to talk about a variety of topics including, albeit in a limited way, uh, Bush versus Gore, as you know, suggested. Um, in my brief time today, though, I'm going to focus on um, the last 15 years of Justice Stevens' career. Um, as was driven home to me in a conversation with someone who clerked for the justice about 25 years ago, if the justice had retired 15 years ago, his reputation would have been very different. Um, the stuff that Jeff talked about, his willingness to write alone, his maverick qualities, his skill as a common law lawyer would not have been one of the major stories, but they would have been the entire lead story. <coughs> he would certainly have been um, an important justice, probably in the top 10% in terms of intellectual ability of anyone who'd ever been on the court. 
top half in terms of influence, maybe top third, known as the author of Chevron. Um, but um, his reputation would have been a little bit different. In the last 15 years, it's my proposition that um, his role shifted, um, and he had the role that he'll be most famous for. Um, in the, hyperbo the hyperbolic language of a blog post that I originally wrote on the subject, um, he captained the defense for 15 years in a pitched battle over the very nature of, judi of judicial review. Um, he was, as I called him, the leader of the resistance. And I want to talk about that role and that story a little bit. Um, the story of how Justice Stevens emerged as the so-called leader of the resistance is really the story of the American constitutional and public law over the last three or four decades. Um, and this story you know, is an important story for law students because it's an object lesson in how the content of constitutional law turns on um, sharply contested debates <laughs> about methods of interpretation, the role of the judge, the background norms of judging, um, the process of making law. Um, when Justice Stevens joined the High Court in 1975, his methods of reasoning and approach to judging were uncontroversial, largely mirroring those of most of his colleagues and immediate predecessors, and resonating with the dominant strands of the American judicial tradition. On matters of constitutional interpretation, he was pragmatic and multivariate, carefully weighing arguments pitched in a wide variety of modalities before reaching his conclusion. On matters of statutory interpretation, he was deeply committed to a partnership model in which judges bear the responsibility to fill in gaps and smooth <coughs> rough edges in order to better effectuate legislative design. For Justice Stevens, and it's my proposition, like the great majority of justices who served before him, a judge was not a neutered umpire passively surveying the field of play, but an active, albeit role-limited, participant in the collective project of creating and maintaining a secure, free, and just constitutional democracy. And now this is important. At the time of his appointment, there was little reason to think that Justice Stevens' deep methodological commitments said much about his substantive views or his relative position on the court's ideological spectrum. While his approach to judging was broadly consistent with the approach of uh, famous liberals like William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall, it was equally accord with the approach of many of the court's more moderate and conservative recent members, including John Harlan, Potter Stewart, Lewis Powell, and in large measure, Byron White. Within a decade, however, the landscape had drastically changed. Motivated by a combination of principle and political calculation that is difficult to untangle, a concerted group of legal and political actors launched an explicit assault on the prevailing norms and practices of our constitutional court, or at least on the dominant strand there. Uh, you guys probably know about all the significant signposts of this attempted at judicial revolution. They've become iconic. The appointment of Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia to the DC Circuit in 1981 and 82, the founding of the Federalist Society in 1982, <laughs> the provocative series of speeches that Attorney General Edwin Meese delivered in 1985 and 1986, and the half successful attempts to elevate Judges Scalia and Bork to the High Court in 1986 and 1987. Um, the challenge posed by the Reagan Justice Department and its intellectual allies has shaped the course of our public law debates for the last quarter century. As Jamal Green, Reva Siegel, and many others have documented, the campaign these conservative re revolutionaries launched was tactically brilliant. Though their immediate concern was the substantive policy implications of the decisions reached by the Warren and Berger courts, they expressed their concerns in more far-reaching and neutral-sounding methodological terms. Though their preferred methodologies reflected at best one of two competing strands in the American judicial tradition, they decried the competing methodologies as not only ill-advised, but also illegitimate. Though the grounds on which they challenged the court were technical and highly contestable, they focused heavily on the rhetoric, wrapping their controversial content in a one-sided vocabulary that marked their opponents as, among other things, judicial activists. Well, from the very beginning, Justice Stevens was an opponent of this turn. Um, it's hard, in fact, to imagine someone whose experience and temperament um, and their views of the role of the judge would have made them any more hostile. And we can talk about that if you'd like, the things in Justice Stevens' life that made him so skeptical about this turn. Um, in the early years of, uh, 
of this debate, Justice Stevens wrote articles, wrote speeches, wrote opinions on these methodological issues. Um, as I've written elsewhere, Justice Stevens routinely decried the static or wooden formalism of originalist constitutional theories and textualist approaches to statutory interpretations. He bravely defended a case-by-case -case <laughs> approach to constitutional interpretation that frankly relies on judicial judgment to resolve difficult cases. And he's withered many a blow from his ascendant conservative colleagues as he modeled a vision, one vision, not the only one, of the judge as a humble and deferential yet actively engaged public servant. Now, for the last 15 years, Justice Stevens has been the senior skeptic on the court. The intellectual and, in ways that seem strange to people who clerked from 25 years ago, tactical leader of the court's anti-originalist, anti-formalist, anti-Reaganite wing. While it's not a role that anyone would have predicted when Justice Stevens joined the court as its politically moderate and methodologically unremarkable just, junior justice in 1975, it's a role that I would argue he was ideally suited to play. Particularly in the last 15 years, Justice Stevens has used his intellectual and tactical skills to defend what was once the mainstream approach to judging against a spirited challenge. In famous cases like Bush versus Gore, parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District Number 1, and Citizens United, he stood up eloquently against majorities he believed were overreaching. In more obscure cases, some of my favorite cases, cases like Alexander versus Sandoval and Zuni Public School District Number 89 versus the Department of Education, he's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Justice Scalia in pitched arguments that often go 50 or 60 footnotes about the first principles of statutory interpretation and the remedial powers of the courts. And in a wide variety of crucial areas, he's crafted opinions or helped hold together coalitions that often improbably have rolled back particularly troubling recent precedents. In this regard, one might note, among others, his opinions uh, in Central Virginia Community College versus Katz in the sovereign immunity area, in Massachusetts versus EPA on standing, Atkins versus Virginia in the Eighth Amendment, and his leadership role in the court's decision to overrule Bowers versus Hardware in Lawrence versus Texas. Surveying the landscape of American public and constitutional law in 2010, most commentators have concluded that at least so far, the revolutionary remaking of American judicial project, um, practice proposed by right-wing lawyers and academics during the early 1980s has been partially successful, but only partially successful. And it's been my thesis here today, and something I'm willing to talk about, and something I've written about, that much of the credit, or depending on your perspective, the blame for slowing the advance of what at one point, the advance of what at one point seemed to be an inevitable revolution falls on the shoulders of humble Justice Stevens. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy. Brock. So it's a, an extraordinary pleasure to be here. Um, I've always wanted to speak at a public law event. When <laughs> I, I, I teach antitrust and contracts, and I usually relegate it to forums about, I don't know, the, the housing crisis or the demise of Wall Street. But this is a profound promotion, and it's delightful to be up here with other Supreme Court clerks. I'm the only one who didn't clerk for the court, and they still let me on. This is really this is exciting. Um, so, okay, your time is up. I, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm the only one that people are going to listen to. Uh, so Justice Stevens was an antitrust attorney before he was uh, a justice, and in fact, before he was a judge. Um, and he was extraordinarily influential in the development of antitrust law. He arrived on the court at a moment where antitrust law was really in, in flux, perhaps even in crisis. Um, uh, and I would like to say that it is no longer in flux or in crisis, and, and he had a significant, significant hand in that. I also think that, and this is, I guess, the two themes of what I'll be talking about, um, I also think that if you get a good sense of how antitrust law is done now, which now, I say, how antitrust is correctly done, which is the way Justice Stevens does antitrust, you might get a good, better sense of his overall jurisprudence. I, I think it's not insignificant that he was an antitrust lawyer before he was on the court. And if we understand what modern antitrust jurisprudence is about, we might get a good sense of what his general jurisprudence is about. So all right, so uh, what did he do with regard to antitrust? Well, uh, when Justice Stevens arrived on the court in 1975, we were in the midst of what was been called the Chicago Revolution. And without going into details, uh, antitrust law was really rather confused and incoherent. 
Uh, it was just starting to understand the significance of economics. It was just trying to understand what economics was and how it's properly applied. Uh, and it was only then starting to infuse antitrust jurisprudence. That's when Justice Stevens arrived. Um, he wrote uh, um, very significant majority opinions in 1978, 1982, 1984, and 1990. All four of those opinions uh, are in all the case books. Uh, and they very systematically build on each other. Uh, 1990 was Supreme Court Trial Lawyers Association. Were you there for that? Or was that the, the previous term? No. Okay, that's too bad. We get more secrets. Um, uh, and what we really have now uh, is a, the, a fairly well-established way of doing Section 1 jurisprudence, antitrust jurisprudence. And it really is referring repeatedly over to those four cases. Justice Stevens wrote another significant opinion, and that was just this last term, 2010. This is the uh, American Needle versus National Football League case that made the news, in part, because, really only because it involved the National Football League. Neil originally asked me to talk about that in the retrospective, and I said, you know, the case really isn't that important, except that it really is a capstone of Justice Stevens' jurisprudence. Um, it really shows what he's been doing over the last three and a half decades to antitrust law. And he took the case really as an opportunity to explicate how antitrust jurisdiction is to be done. All right. Um, what is, how, it, how is antitrust done now as a result of Justice Stevens? Well, I, I think I want to repeat what some of the, the previous speakers talked about. Antitrust now is does not rely on formalisms or categorical thinking. It's very much a detail-oriented analysis. It looks very carefully at the conduct in question and it asks whether it is pro-competitive or anti-competitive. It looks, tries to figure out exactly how, what the consequences, what the purposes of certain conduct is and what the consequences of, the, of that conduct is, the consequences on the operation of the marketplace. It's all about details. It's not about legal theory. Uh, and Justice Stevens, his opinions, especially the seminal ones, are very careful analyses of the facts, really looking at specifically what conduct is in question, what the specific consequences are of that conduct. And that's really what drives his entire analysis. And that is the analysis that other, uh, other justices have followed, and that now antitrust, it's now how antitrust is done. The other thing that was previously mentioned, which is really fascinating, is uh, his go it alone approach. And probably the most significant antitrust opinion that's been written is, was in 1979, uh, only a couple years after Justice Stevens arrived. It was eight to one, and Justice Stevens was the dissenter. So what happened there? This is a very interesting window. This is a story where, again, it's probably the most significant case in the last 30, 40 years. And Justice Stevens was in the dissent. He Again, he's a very relatively young justice at the time. Uh, he was only, on for, only, only there for about, this is his fourth year. And he said, you know, the court got the law right, but didn't apply it. If you look carefully at the facts, we can, instead of remand, we can discard this opinion. We can, we can solve it ourselves. Antitrust largely is about trying to figure out what you know and whether it's enough to make a decision. And in these other cases, in 78, in 82, in 84, 90 was an easier fact, but these are very complicated cases. And Justice Stevens ends them, not swiftly, but only after a very careful and detailed analysis of the facts. It to me shows not only an amazing level, uh, attention to detail, but also a good degree of confidence once that detailed analysis is done. There's nothing else to be done. Once the analysis can be done, he does the analysis. All right, so uh, number one, he was very influential in shaping modern antitrust law. Number two, the reason he did that was largely his ability to, to be independent-minded and focus on detail. Number three, what else do we learn about his cases? I, I think we also see in these antitrust cases a bit of a unifier. Um, the 1978 opinion was five to three. One, one justice recused. The 1982 opinion was four to three, two justices recused. 84 was seven to two, and 90 was six to three. 2010, unanimous. 
And that actually was the, the boldest opinion of all of them. That was the one where he really went beyond what he needed to do. It really showed that there was some kind of common uh, sense of what antitrust is as a result of his contributions. Um, what's also fascinating about these cases in 78, 82, 84, and 90 is the lineup. In 78, the defendants, okay, so all these are cases where the defendants are probably doing something bad. And, you know, the, the specific conduct in question is always, oh, it always varies, but what always is salient is who are the defendants? For example, in American Needle, the defendant was the NFL. Um, that was most salient. Uh, in, in 78, the defendants were engineers. On Stevens' side were Stewart and White, Marshall and Powell. On the other side, Blackman, Rehnquist, and Berger. In 82, it was the doctors. The doctors were the defendants. On Stevens' side were Brennan, White, and Marshall. On the other side, Powell, Berger, and Rehnquist. This, it might be a, it might, might be, it's opinions like these why people thought that Stevens was on the left side of the court. Uh, in 84, it was Rehnquist and Powell on the other side. I'm sorry, Rehnquist and White on the other side. And then in 1990, the defendants were public interest lawyers. <laughs> on, the, on Stevens' side, Rehnquist, White, O'Connor, Scalia, Kennedy. <laughs> on the other side, Brennan, Marshall, and Blackman. Stevens is the only one who gets it right every time. And he gets it right, I think, because of an enormous degree of, of, uh, of conviction, of principle. Uh, it, it really is, he, he was never confused by the complicated facts. He always did follow where he wanted to go. And what's an interesting paradox between point number two, which is he went on his own, and point number three is that he was a unifier, is that you got a sense of how he unified the court. It was by sticking basically to the facts. It was not by marshalling the court. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm speculating. It's not by marshalling the court, but by having a very basic, down-to-earth, dare I say it, humble jurisprudence. Uh, and the court coalesced around that. And I'll end with, with really, my, my favorite opinion is the 1990 opinion. It's the Supreme Court trial. He, he, he has no sympathy for these public interest lawyers. The public interest lawyers are colluding, essentially, the same way pipe manufacturers do. And he applies the antitrust law as vigorously to these guys as he would to anybody. Um, it shows a, a real commitment to markets, a, a, a commitment to uh, even-handedness. Uh, you might say it's a commitment to being moderate. We're going to apply the law even-handedly. We believe in markets. We do not believe in status economies. We also do not believe in uh, excessive laissez-faire. I'm going to enforce the, the antitrust laws as Congress required us to do, uh, and we're going we're gonna to see where it takes us. And in this opinion where he says the Supreme Court trial lawyers, albeit well-intentioned, and perhaps they might be doing good God's work, they are not entitled to break the antitrust laws. It's a very, very straightforward and a very, very admirable opinion. Uh, it's very clear. The law is very clear as a result of that case. And in, in large part, that's one reason why antitrust jurisprudence really has settled the way it has. It's because both of his detail and also his forcefulness. Uh, so I would love to, to jump into the fray when it comes to federalism and equal protection. Um, and I might. But, uh, but looking at it, Stevens' any, antitrust has, uh, I, I've acquired an enormous amount of admiration for him. More and more each time I teach these cases. Uh, and I think there is a little window into how he approaches the job of the court and the jurisprudence that he's applied very broadly. Thank you, Barack. Ernie. Well, I want to thank Neil and the Center for Public Law for putting this together and inviting me to participate. I'm supposed to talk to, about Justice Stevens and federalism, but maybe the best tribute to, to Justice Stevens um, even more so than, than wearing a bow tie, is I the only one, really? Um, <laughs> is to dissent from the conventional wisdom. And I just want to briefly dissent um, from the idea of some kind of vast right-wing conspiracy to assault our traditional role of, of the courts. And, and even more to dissent um, from the idea of the Supreme Court as just this pitched ideological battleground where the good people are going up against the bad people all the time. Um, I don't think that's the way 
Justice Stevens, at least in my experience, saw it, and I don't think that's what you see in the opinions. Um, for instance, Justice Stevens, rather than engaging in pitched methodological battles over whether we should be originalists or not, pretty good originalists, right? In a case like term limits or, or prints, he rolled up his sleeves, you know, probably made his clerks roll up their sleeves too, sent them down to the rare book room at the court, and they dug out the history and, and went toe to toe. I mean, I think the, uh, the term limits opinions, for instance, which hopefully a lot of you will read in constitutional law, it's the historian's battle of the psalm, right? I mean, we're just in, in our trenches and slugging it out, you know, per page after page after page of, of historical citation. And I think, you know, beautifully done work on, on both sides for the most part. I think you'd see the same thing in, in Prince and, and some of the other, especially in the federalism area, but not just in the federalism area. So I, th I think he was, was he, he, probably the best lawyer all around on the court and content um, to play on a lot of different playing fields methodologically, which I always admired a lot about him. On the, on the activism versus deference debate, I mean, this man is the author of the Chevron opinion, which is the most deferential, and there's a, there's a complicated history there. It certainly becomes um, one of the most deferential um, Supreme Court precedents to executive authority that there is. And I, I think, um, you know, it, it's a moderate record. It, it's a, a, a record of being willing to go along on a lot of points, being willing to draw a line on the sand and others. It, it's a very complicated and nuanced story. I mean, he, he was in many ways the most nuanced of, of our justices, and I've always admired that about him. And I think that the federalism stuff illustrates um, that point. Federalism, um, under the Rehnquist Court especially, but, but bleeding into the Roberts Court, has been billed as a, a vast ideological battleground. Um, if you ask people what made the Rehnquist Court so conservative, it, it's cases like United States versus Lopez, which is you know, the first time that the Supreme Court struck down an act of Congress as going beyond Congress's commerce power since 1937. That is kind of a big deal. Um, and cases like that, Seminole Tribe versus Florida, the, the, the leading 11th Amendment decision, Prince versus United States on the anti-commandeering doctrine, those of you who are 1Ls will, will see all this stuff in time, I promise. Um, and in the, and those cases were, in a sense, you know, very ideologically divided. There were five conservative justices, Rehnquist, O'Connor, Kennedy, Scalia, Thomas, who were voting for the states in those cases and against national power. There were four liberal justices consistently voting for national power, led by Justice Stevens and Justice Souter, Justice Breyer, and Ginsburg, um, and a series of 5-4 rulings. So the conventional wisdom is that the Rehnquist court was divided between a, a nationalist faction, who were the liberals, um, and had four votes, and, and a states' rights faction, who were the conservatives, and, and had five. Um, I think that perception gets turned on its head if you look at another set of cases, and these are cases about federal preemption of state law. Under the Supremacy Clause, federal law preempts state law if there's a conflict. But whether there's a conflict um, or whether Congress intended to preempt state law is often a very, very difficult question. Um, and in, in contrast to a few blockbusters under the Commerce Clause of the 11th Amendment, which come along every few years maybe, um, the court hears three or four preemption cases a year. These are terribly important cases. So these are cases, for instance, about things like, does the FDA's certification of a drug as fit for sale, as safe for, for human consumption, does that preempt a state tort suit um, for, you know, negligent manufacturer or failure to warn about the risks of the drug? Or um, is an individual state entitled to go further than the federal government ha has gone in, in regulating tobacco sales to minors? Or is the state of Washington um, allowed to impose stricter regulations on um, oil tankers than federal law would require? Right? So these, these preemption cases are, are pervasive. There's lots and lots of them. Um, and they pose important questions for federalism because these are really where the rubber meets the road in federal in American federalism. This is, will the state government get to continue to regulate something, or is the federal government going to regulate that thing? Um, and so if you look at these cases, the liberals, the supposed nationalists, tend to vote for the states much more consistently than the conservatives in these cases. And Justice Stevens is by far the leader um, of the, the four justices who often manage to get a fifth or a sixth or a seventh vote in these cases and uphold state law against a federal preemption challenge. So in cases like Cipollone about cigarette regulation or Geyer about airbag safety and, and state tort law or Lorillard about um, 
you know, tobacco sales to minors, or Wyeth and, and Good, and, and you know, two terms ago about drugs and, and um, cigarettes again. Um, consistently, Justice Stevens is the one who is sticking up for the states, sticking up for the, for the continued viability of state law and state regulation, often with the supposedly states' rights conservatives in dissent. Um, and I think what emerges um, in these cases is a distinct vision of federalism. I mean, Justice Stevens he faced, you know, loves to say at the outset of his dissents in these cases or his majority opinions, this is a case about federalism, because that, that's a line that he's stolen from the majority in another context where he was dissenting, and they said that to him. Um, but he, he chides the majority for forgetting you know, about the states. You know, they're all for it when it's a Commerce Clause case like Lopez, but they forget all about the states when it gets to be um, a question of federal preemption, and Justice Stevens consistently says, you know, these are important federalism cases too. I mean, I think there's two qualities to, to Justice Stevens' vision of federalism that are, are terribly important. One is that it focuses on the right thing. It focuses on the autonomy of the states, their ability to govern themselves, their ability to enact innovative forms of regulation, for instance, um, and not have it supplanted by, by federal law. The cases in which the you know, more conservative justices have tended to stand up for the states are much more about just kind of walling off the states from being accountable when they violate federal law in some area, when they you know, um, discriminate against people under the federal civil rights laws or when they violate people's patents or copyrights. Um, they're really about leaving the states alone, not allowing the states to do anything. And I think Justice Stevens' focus on, on the right of states to actually govern um, is much more helpful in the area of federalism. And the second thing that, that um, I think is, is unique to the Stevens vision of federalism is it focuses on a collaborative role for the court with Congress. So in a case like Lopez, the court is confronting Congress. It's, it's striking down congressional legislation. It's drawing a line in the sand. You can only go this far and no further. We will, we will sh shoot you down if you step over the line. In these preemption cases, these are cases about statutory construction. They're trying to figure out not what Congress could do, but what it has done. And a terribly important ingredient in these cases is something called the presumption against preemption, which is a canon of statutory construction. It's a default rule. If Congress is unclear, then we will read Congress as not intending to preempt state law. We know they could if they wanted to, but if they haven't spoken clearly, we will read the federal statute narrowly and preserve an important scope for state autonomy. Um, it's a collaborative role in the sense that it effectively sends it back to Congress. If Congress wants to go further, they can amend the statute, make their intent clearer, and, and then that, you know, what they say goes. Um, it's not drawing a line in the sand, but at the same time, it's nudging Congress in the direction of being a little more solicitous of constitutional values. And I think that collaborative role, at, at the end of the day, is likely to work a lot better. Um, than what the, the conservatives had been up to for the most part. Um, it's not a perfect vision of federalism. I think sometimes you have to draw a line in the sand. I think Lopez, you know, it's, it's still hard for me to imagine how anybody could descend Lopez, but, and, and, you know, well, but, but by and large, I think this collaborative model and this focus on the autonomy of the states to regulate, to govern themselves, that's the, right, the most promising avenue for the court in federalism cases. And, and, and it is, by and large, Justice Stevens' brainchild. So, um, I guess the last thing I can say is a, a note of, of pessimism, and that is I think that vision may be dying. I, I think the, the new conservative appointments to the court are not particularly states' rights people. They're people who have spent their entire lives in, in the federal government and, and likely not to be particularly protective. And I think the liberal appointments to the, to the, the court as well are, are somewhat unlikely to share Justice Stevens' federalist vision. Um, somebody like Elena Kagan, I think, very solicitous of federal regulation, very um, eager to empower federal administrative agencies to do things like, you know, like preempt state law, I suspect. I, I'd love to be wrong about these predictions, but I'm afraid I'm not. Um, and I think we're going to miss Justice Stevens very, very much. Well, thank you, Ernie, and thanks to all of the panelists. As, as is sometimes common at these events, uh, uh, all of your observations are, are overwhelmingly uh, overwhelmingly uh, positive and affirming of Justice Stevens. And um, I share those views. Uh, I also think he deserves it. Um, and I think I deserve it. I want to feel good about a good person and a good justice. Um, but let me, um, let me do what Ernie said and dissent for purposes of discussion, right? And take what each of you have said and turn it around into 
a criticism of Justice Stevens, and there are certainly plenty of critics of Justice Stevens, right? So Jeff, you talk about um, the word humility comes up, and yet Justice Stevens is very happy to strike a bunch of stuff down, right? Scott against Harris is a case in which he's alone, right, seeing a constitutional problem with what the police did. He's not deferring, right? Um, you also talk about independence and, you know, being a mavericky, right? And that could be described as quirky and idiosyncratic and really no ability to lead or build coalitions. You could be go off on your own because you're kind of um, outside the mainstream, right? Um, Andy, you talk about being a leader of, of the resistance, right? Um, and there's obviously some disagreement on the panel about the conservative assault on the course, the way you put it, but is he behaving just as ideologically in opposition, right? Um, uh, Barack, you think uh, his views on antitrust law make a whole lot of good sense from an economic perspective, right? But shouldn't it have been Congress's role to enact that vision of antitrust and not up to Justice Stevens to impose it on the rest of us? Um, Ernie, you expressed the, uh, disagreement with Andy, and part of what you said was he's very comfortable methodologically using all different kinds of modes of interpretation. And his critics will say, right, and that leaves him beholden to very little, right? He can do what he wants. Uh, because he has so many different tools available. So, so uh, what do you say about any or all or other possible criticisms, right, of this justice? Who, if I'm speaking for myself, um, um, I also admire quite a bit as well. Well, I, I, I guess I just I, when I think about Justice Stevens, I, I think that's certainly right. I mean, there's certainly times when I think he was probably less effective than he might have been. Uh, as you know, the, the maverick uh, in some ways. Uh, I, I guess when I think about his decisions, though, I tend to think of decisions that, you know, that, I don't know, there's not that many quotable, famous Stevens decisions. And I guess in some ways that kind of, in my mind, reflects on the fact of um, uh, the, the degree to which he was relatively careful about what he was doing. And it, and it may be that that means that uh, you don't have this extremely strong sort of principled intellectual core that runs through everything he did. But I think that the thing that happened is that there was a very strong principled sort of procedural core in what he did, which was this, this care that he took in deciding cases and making dis decisions along the way. And, and so I, I, I think that, uh, you know, in, in responding to critics that would have liked to see him do both more and both less, uh, you know, I, I guess, uh, and I guess it's not that surprising for somebody who clerked for Stevens that, that, that the drive down the middle of the road was the right place to be, so. Right. <clears throat> I mean, partially in response to uh, what, what Neil was su suggesting and partially with regard to um, what Ernie was saying, I think that um, clearly Justice <coughs> Stevens, as everybody else has demonstrated, um, like almost all, maybe all of his colleagues in the time he was there, was a careful lawyer. And um, that role of fidelity certainly is a significant part of his legacy. And um, the, fa the fact of role fidelity of Justice Stevens and a lot of his other colleagues um, on the bench um, certainly created some of the muting of methodological or ideological conflict um, that, Ernie is that Ernie is talking about. So um, there's nuance, and it's not just nuance. It's part of the design of the system, right? Uh, if you get the right people with the right, with the right professional experiences and the right intellect on there, um, Methodological battle, cultural battle about how to interpret the Constitution is not going to take the same form that it takes in partisan politics. Um, in response to what Neil was saying, though, I think that um, that I don't mean to describe um, to describe anyone on the court as um, partisan in a way that is unequivocally problematic. Um, I think that um, it's, easy to, um, it's easy to fall into that caricature. And I said I used some hyperbolic language here. I'm coming off of a blog post, and I feel strongly about the merits of these issues. Um, so it's easy to, to think about what I'm saying is that there are good guys, and there, there are good guys, and there are bad guys, people who understand the role of a judge and people, and people who don't. Um, but I want to recast that a little bit as, um, I think there's a certain inevitability to the kind of conflict that I'm talking about. Um, there is so much that is underdetermined and undetermined about constitutional law, about the meaning of the Constitution, and about other public law issues. So much is going to turn on kind of core questions about um, methodology, core questions about the vision of a judge, kind of what kind of constitutional culture we have. Um, 
I would, I would defend Justice Stevens and at the same time, you know, give a pass to his, um, to his, the, his colleagues who he disagrees with on these issues in saying that kind of these titanic struggles about what it means to be a judge and what our constitutional culture is going to look like and what the norms of interpretation are going to be um, are in fact part of their job and not stepping outside the role too much. Okay. Thank you. We may never know who the real winner is of the 2000 election, but we'll know who the loser was. I just wanted to quote Justice Stevens. <laughs> yeah. Um, he is not unquotable. He is, in fact, quite quotable. Uh, so you know, your question to me is an easy one in the sense that uh, antitrust law is a delegation to the courts and was established in essentially early opinions in 1900, 1910. So that's not terribly controversial. But I, 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 I do think that... Um, that this idea of uh, of multiple multiple methodologies does come out in the antitrust opinion. It, it, there really is an eschewing of ideological hegemony and methodological hegemony in his opinions. Um, we are not thinking in categories. Uh, we are not doing uh, true, uh, you might say, a legal analysis. We're doing really factual and functional analysis. Um, and, and I think he he brings people together under that umbrella. The opinion in 2010 that really, I think, is the capstone of jurisprudence, it begins with citing both a Brandeis opinion, which is you know, slightly discredited now, and a Thomas opinion, which is slightly discredited now. Um, and you know, it, it's, he's not, wasn't making any enemies, but on the other hand, he isn't invalidating any approaches. Um, uh, and I think in that sense, his jurisprudence is rather accessible. Uh, and, uh, and he can, you know, uh, it's not surprising that in a, in a court where there is some methodological extremism, he sometimes on his own, he sometimes has brought people together. So what's always driven me nuts about Justice Stevens' opinions is he'll give seven reasons <laughs> why we're coming out this way. And then, you know, my students will raise their hand and say, well, what if, you know, six wasn't there next time? Right? Or what about five? You know, what if it's only one through four? Does it still come out the same way? And, and my answer, I don't know. Right? I mean, ask him again. And then he'll tell you, you know, which, which ones of, of the seven you know, really mattered. And I, I think it, it's almost like he can't help it. I mean, he, I, I really think he was the best, you know, just all-around lawyer on the court. He just kept thinking and kept thinking up more reasons. And, you know, you could criticize Justice O'Connor for, for something similar, which it wouldn't be that she'd have seven different reasons. It, it, she'd have a test that was so open-ended, it's basically apply your best judgment. And, and you know, if you're Justice O'Connor, your best judgment is really, really good. Um, but, but you do have to come back and ask again in the next case. And, and I think, you know, this is both annoying and, you know, it's annoying to us who want to tie it up for you in a, in a nice bow, and it's annoying for you who want to put it down in your outline and, and know what to say on the exam. Um, but I think it, it, it comes together with what Jeff said about his conception of the role of the court as fairly narrow and fairly constrained. We're not the only actor in the system, he, he thinks. You know, it, it's okay to leave things undecided, and more importantly, it's okay to leave a lot of stuff to the lower courts, because when, when the Supreme Court doesn't come out with a bright line rule, um, doesn't tell you which factors are always going to matter. What they're really doing is they're delegating a lot of authority to the lower courts to play this out and, and see how it happens in an endless stream of cases that are variations on the theme of the first one. And you know, if, if they go off in wildly divergent you know, directions or come up with something really loony, um, then the Supreme Court may step in again, but they're not trying to control everything um, at the outset. So I think he did have a, a vision of the role of the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the lower courts as you know, partners, not just dictating, but, but being content to, to see what would, what would play out um, in the cases that would come after. We have time for a few questions. I'm sure you folks have questions about Justice Stevens. Mm -hmm. Shall I ask another question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a debate about term limits uh, for Supreme Court justices, right? And whether the justices are serving too long, right? 80s, the new 70, um, and where is accountability in all this, right? Justice Stevens is on the court um, for almost 35 years, appointed by Ford, 
right? What, do you, what should the example of Justice Stevens, um, how should that, that um, um, affect the debate about term limits for Supreme Court justices? Is he a great example of why we don't need them? Or is he an example, uh, as good as you all think uh, uh, he was in many ways, why we nonetheless ought to have them? I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think that the central argument in favor of term limits that you know, we don't control how the justices age and they've been serving to too, to too, to, to too late an age and we have to worry about uh, their abilities, I think that is certainly undercut by Justice, by Justice Stevens' experience to the extent that you know, one piece of data could ever solve something like that. I think Justice Stevens worked strongly and well till the end and some of his best opinions and most important work were in the last years. Um, I do think that the experience Justice Stevens and the justices around him do give rise, though, to I think if, if you're going to support such a program, it's not so much because you're worried about um, the older justices, but because you want to regularize appointments. And I think Neil and I have, uh, Neil, Neil and I have talked about this. Um, if, as I believe, constitutional law is inevitably politically inflected and inevitably involves methodological and cultural debates, um, one of the virtues of, of the system we have is that if, this, if law is politics, it's not the politics of one generation, but it's a conversation between the politics of a variety of different generations. Um, you win an election, you get to be part of the conversation for the next three decades. Um, and um, appointments have not, just by random happenstance, have not been evenly distributed um, over, the last, uh, three, over the last three or four decades between the winners of, between the winners of various elections. Um, and, um, you know, it's possible that um, the Justice, the Justice Stevens and the experience of the last few decades have shown that there might be some, there might be, I'm not in favor of it, but I see the argument, um, some virtue in regularizing um, the appointments, um, knowing for sure if you win an election how many, appointment, how many appointments you're going to get. But in terms of um, worrying about the justice's abilities, Justice Stevens gives a little bit of a lie to that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I point out, I was looking back at the confirmation hearings, uh, there was full disclosure, Justice Stevens pointed out to the senators, that his mother lived until she was uh, 98. Uh, so, so it's not like he was hiding the ball at the time. Uh, uh, but I, I think one of the things that's interesting is, is to think about, and, and I think it was a few years ago at a, a Fordham conference that the justice spoke as, where he talked about how the importance of, of changing over time. And, you know, there's this speculation, did the justice change? Did the court change around him? And there, there's probably elements of both. But I, I think the ability of the justices to maintain an open mind, uh, maybe, I don't know, in, in some ways it, it both sort of increases yet dampens down the concern, Neil, that, that you point out. You know, on one hand you say, well, they need to reflect the politics of the time, and so if, if they change, then they're obviously not reflecting the politics of the time. Uh, at the same time, their ability to shift a little bit over time and to think about what the world looks like and how the world has changed uh, m minimizes maybe some of the concerns that might otherwise be there uh, for somebody who's serving for life. Great. I don't have anything to say about that, but I do have a question in case there isn't a question from the audience. Question from the audience. Okay, bro. All right, so you got one. Oh. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I know that uh, Justice Stevens was the only one not to pool his clerks. Um, and I'm wondering about what his thought process was behind that and also what his general thought process was in selecting cases for the court to hear. I, mean, I, I would explain what it means, that's okay. what the pool means. Oh, um, uh, starting. Starting in the mid-70s, um, most of the justices, um, at one point as many as eight of the justices, and now, though now Justice Alito is out of the pool as far as we understand, um, as many as eight of the justices um, um, took um, their clerks and created, as I said, a pool whereby um, when cert petitions came in, requests to, for the courts to hear cases, um, that petition would initially get looked at and have a memo drafted um, by one of the clerks for the court, as opposed to each of the chambers having to independently look at the petition. And Justice Stevens, um, as well as a few of the justices who retired in the 70s and 80s, and now Justice Alito, um, did not join the pool. His clerks did not work for the pool, but instead handled all the cases themselves, and to the extent that memos were needed, drafted them themselves for Justice Stevens. Um, uh, do you want to ask what that means? So was that just brutally punishing? <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 as a mechanic, right? Be, you would get a stack this high every week, yeah. and we would get a stack 
this high. But my under, my understanding was that he wanted a check, right? Yeah. He wanted a check on the court. You have one clerk writing a memo for the whole conference, the whole court, and he wanted somebody outside the pool to have another set of clerks looking at the case just to keep people honest. But right? I do think or, it also reflected and not make mistakes. Yeah, and it reflected an interesting level of trust with the clerks, deference like he does to lower court judges right. and to everybody else. He didn't expect you Colors. to write a memo on every case that was non-frivolous. Mm -hmm. He expected memos telling him about the cases that he ought to do something about or that he thought someone else wanted to do something about or was of the highest profile or was a death case. So um, there were many cases that no clerk wrote a memo uh, that no clerk wrote a memo for for Justice Stevens, um, that um, you know were significant that, that that were significant cases, and the system worked well in part because there was the check of the pool and of the of the other justices' interests. In terms of what kind of cases he was looking for, I think it's quite clear, and it's in, you know it's it's in the public record that he thought that there were interesting, important cases out there that the court wasn't deciding because they didn't fit what had become formalized cert criteria. There was no split. It was, um, it was a case that thus far had only aris arisen in one place, a unique First Amendment case or something like that. I remember my term, um, the big issue was there was a dispute for a while. I don't know if anyone knows about it, but there was a dispute for a while about whether it was consistent with the First Amendment to ban Ku Klux Klan chapters from adopting highways in those highway adoption programs that were open to everybody. And there were all sorts of technical reasons why it was not a great candidate for cert. But in my term and in several other terms surrounding it, Justice Stevens thought that was the kind of interesting, important case, um, no matter how unique it was, that the court would have decided 10, 15, 20 years ago and should be taking more of. Well, I want to thank uh, our panelists very much for their time and thoughts today. I also want to put on your radar over another public law event. This Thursday at lunch is going to be a review of important civil decisions from the past term. And just a brief note to my students, just because a case is mentioned here does not mean that you are responsible for it. <laughs> Have a great day. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.